Let us start it by welcoming my first guest. He is the principal of the Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Safety. I came across him um, by his work. I'm going through the newspaper one Sunday and I look at this and I go like, hmm, an analysis of the judicial system with some recommendations. And the more I looked into it, I said, hmm, that's what we're talking about. Not echoing, but in fact, finding solutions. So let me welcome my guest, Ian Kevin Ramdani. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, there we go. There is your microphone. How long have you been at the Institute? Um, three years. The Institute was established in June 2013. So mm-hmm. it's three years at the Institute as the principal. It is three years as the principal as the Institute. Now, uh, fixing our criminal justice system, there are many questions in the public arena, in the public arena that beg uh, answers, context, and clarity, including the establishment of a night court system for petty crimes, gun court specializing in court, uh, you know, you know, uh, gun court specializing in gun issues, a drug court specializing in drug issues. You um, have seen uh, through your 17 years of experience teaching, researching, and developing public policy. A lot of things spoken about, but very little done. Let's talk about our court system. I want to start in the area of um, a recent, your recent article stated one of the biggest problems facing TNT concerns the criminal justice system. Overall, it has not stepped up to the plate. You are saying no matter where um, they start from now, they're starting so far behind the ball, and you don't see the sense of urgency in correcting it. First of all, explain to our listeners, uh, Kevin Ramdani, I don't know if you prefer Ian or Kevin. Ian. <laughs> Ian. Um, explain, uh, explain to our listeners, why is the judicial system in Trinidad and Tobago so far behind the ball when we strive for first worldism? And uh, there's so many things that we would think with the um, fortune we had of, um, of revenue that um, an important area like mm-hmm. the judiciary should have been funded and should have been further along than we are. Yes. All right. Good morning again. Um, the judiciary is one of the hallmarks of our democracy. Mm-hmm. One of the main outcomes, objectives of the judiciary is, t- is to bring judicial fairness and sentencing um, in a reasonable time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, what we have seen over the years, um, cases are there pending for decade, for over a decade, 12, 13, 14, even 15 years. Simple matters are there for 12, 13, 14, 15 years without any resolution. Mm-hmm. Um, in a nutshell, because of that, we can come to the conclusion that the judiciary is inefficient at this point in time, and there are things that we need to do as a society, as a society to increase this efficiency. Justice denied one person is justice denied to all, and justice delayed is justice denied equally. And that is why it was so important, I felt, to have you here this morning. So again, in thanking you, you point out that the system must work effectively, and in order for it to start on that journey, we must have the three branches of of, of, of our system working, which is to say police, correction, and the judiciary. You say it is in a woeful state, or you find it woefully wanting. Explain. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, again, the three arms of the criminal justice system are the police, which does the investigation and the detection and brings it towards the second arm, which is the judicial system, mm-hmm. which would adjudicate on the matter, and then depending on the person is guilty, forward it to the corrections department. All three subs will be working in tandem. Um, what we found is there are inefficiencies, again, in all three arms of the criminal justice system. Now, this is not to say that there are certain aspects that are not working. Eh? Mm-hmm. We are agreeing on that up front. Um, but there are major aspects of each arm that is not functioning mm-hmm. well. In fact, they are not even functioning as a team, for example. I, and, and, and that is one of the areas that, that, that's disturbing because you said the, the connectivity is absent. We talk of technology and you don't even have it happening efficiently in the individual bodies far more for the interconnectivity that is required here. Yes, because, for example, in the law enforcement aspect, which is the first aspect, one of the items which we use to measure the efficiency of the law enforcement of police would be the detection rate. Mm-hmm. And we know it's woefully low, 10, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. probably around 10% average. Um, and this is despite the expressed opinion or objective of, the, of law enforcement for the detection rate to be around 30 to 40%. So you see, we are lagging behind as mm-hmm, well. Mm-hmm. But even with 30 to 40%, you just imagine it, eh? out, out of 10 crimes reported, we are projecting 3 to 4 to be detected or solved. That's hopefully low again. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Then it goes across now to the judiciary, and it's taken years to go, and there's a lot of reasons why this 
there are delays in this um, judicial system. And then you go across to the prison system now too. And again, there are a set of problems here in the prison system dealing from starting from the remand straight through the convicted prisoners. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can break this down and, 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 and spend the first part dealing with the process because you have um, a backlog um, um, before the courts and many have, uh, have opined, commented uh, and statistics tell us that one of the aspects that work um, uh, antithetical to a smooth running system is the question of one attorney having too many cases not turning up um, to represent, and of course, the, uh, you know, a postponement is there, and you keep postponing, postponing, postponing. And the question uh, comes to mind, how do we best, or how would you suggest um, that it best be dealt with in the area of having, uh, not having a select group of attorneys handling so many cases that when the cases are called, they are unable to um, to treat with it. Right. All right. We must start off on the premise that we should not deny an attorney the allowance to be able to have many, as many clients as he wishes. That is his private right, right? Mm -hmm. So start mm -hmm. with that premise. Mm -hmm. However, if an attorney takes on X number of cases, he or she has to put systems in place to be able to deal with those many cases if they would be called upon by the judicial system. Yes. So therefore it calls in the question what is what, what are the management systems or administrative systems in place in the judiciary as well mm -hmm. and in his own staff complement. For example, there may be other attorneys in his department or in, or in his um, company or in his firm that who, who can deal with those matters as well. It shouldn't be, and normally it's not really reliant on one attorney, it's normally a team of attorneys. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. really an excuse in, in a sense. So you were looking, by the way, the, my, my guest you're hearing this morning is uh, Ian Ramdani, the principal of Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Safety. So in this case, um, would you say that it is something that now should go before a judicial, the law body, law association, somebody, to look where you have, uh, you can look at the data and see a pattern of uh, inability to represent a client because of conflict of scheduling, et cetera, et cetera. And as such, some action should be taken against attorneys who find themselves in this situation. Is that one possibility of remedying that uh, that problem? Yes, that is one possibility. And even that, um, within the law association, they have their own codes of conduct, mm -hmm. which they regulate themselves, for example. So they should be able to come up with proper solutions to regulate the industry because because they know it, it affects them as well too. Have you had sufficient time in your research to look at what is the governing um, rules for that association vis-a-vis -vis an attorney being oversubscribed, as it were, unable to accurately or to to, to fully represent his clients in, in a speedy manner? Um, unfortunately, I didn't have the, to look at it exactly, but there is a principle there in the association that... Uh, that that a customer or client mm -hmm. can report his attorney to the association and say, I have not been represented appropriately. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, so there's that provision there. If, if a client finds every time I'm, my case is being postponed every time, you know, they can report that to the association for um, some kind of disciplinary action to be taken. So, right. so, so that provision is there. That's one one of the many branches mm -hmm. uh, of this tree, the problems on the tree of the judiciary. We're talking about the appeal process, uh, too lengthy, and it reeks of delay. Tactics is what your report, is what your article said. Elaborate on that, please. Yes. Well, the delay, the, the appeal process, okay? Mm -hmm. After matter is determined by the magistrate court level or at the high court level, um, the, the defendant can apply for appeal of this decision, which normally goes to the appeal court. Mm -hmm. And normally there's a time frame for it. What we found out in our research is that normally these attorneys wait to the last moment of the expiration of the appeal time period to do the appeals as well, mm -hmm. as well as their host of what we public team to call the frivolous appeals. Frivolous appeals. Yes, right? yes. It's just to frustrate the system, as we mm -hmm. say. Wasting the court's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is one of the reasons that I always believe that it's just about in every judgment there should be cost. And there <laughs> should be a cost that, uh, to the taxpayer that should be 
put on to the person who uh, bring in these frivolous suits. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a, a whole, <laughs> whole different issue. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah, is uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 12 minutes after 10 o'clock. I, I want to go back quickly because I, you know, I sort of jumped myself uh, a little too fast there. I want to finish off with these attorneys because private attorney fees are high. Many people have to resort to state-funded attorneys. In, in dealing with this question of the attorneys of a certain caliber and the limited amount of attorneys that are taking cases, have your research brought you that we have sufficient one state-funded attorneys or legal aid um, sort mm-hmm. of thing? Do we have uh, sufficient of that uh, or, or do we need to have a greater infusion in that area? And that question of attorney fees is the second part I want you to to get on because the fee structure seems to be willy-nilly. I know you suggested in your research that there is a system that one can consider. So I want you to go to that right after you deal with the area of the state-funded attorneys for me, please. Right. Um, the legal aid department has been complaining year after year that we need more legal aid attorneys to join our clinic. Mm. So, so there's a lack of legal aid attorneys. That's one. Secondly, they have also been complaining that the fees that they are allowed to pay these legal aid attorneys are pretty low. Mm. compared to what they have gotten in private practice. So there is no attraction for an attorney to go volunteer himself to be a legal aid, aid attorney. So there is a supply and demand issue mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Therefore, what you may result in, you, it may end up being that there are some attorneys who may not be that experienced in law, mm-hmm. who may apply to be a legal aid attorney. So therefore, the, 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 public, the, the public person there who may be able to, can't afford an attorney by himself, may have to rely on a less experienced attorney via the legal aid clinic, mm. and therefore he, his social case may suffer. In the case of where an attorney, for instance, his, his education, his time uh, studying, is in any way subsidized um, by the government, not dissimilar to a sort of gate arrangement, and there's a certain amount of time you must give back to, 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 to the state. Um, if you had a, 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 a group of experienced attorneys leading and adequately compensated by the state, but they are supported by those who, the new attorneys coming in, who in fact benefited from the subsidies of the state. Is that not a part solution? Or, and, and does that exist now? And if, if it does not, could that be a part solution to this? Yes, from my knowledge, that system exists already, mm-hmm. where okay. you have the junior persons coming in and mm-hmm. you have the senior attorneys guiding and advising them. And they are around. coming in because they were beneficiaries of some subsidy of the state? I mean, is that part of that, that, that sort of, um, um, you know, uh, get funded if we help you with your studies? Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to give back to the country two years, for instance. And it is specified in this area because, I mean, you know, that, that, that is mm-hmm. what you are. You're an attorney. We need people. In right. I'm not too sure there's a direct connection between an mm. attorney at law who does who gets mm. gate funded will will have to must come back to the legal aid. Mm. I'm not too sure that's mm. direct. But I want to assume that, that some mm. some of those attorneys who got gate fund, funded would come back to the legal aid attorney. Is the legal there legal any uh, are there any guidelines then? Let's go on to the the other step of the attorneys with the fees uh, that attorneys mm-hmm. are charging. Uh, uh, you know, mm-hmm. right? There is a general guideline in the, again in the law association in their documentation for their for, for their profession. There's a general guideline, um, but there are always ways and means of getting a wrong mm-hmm. guidelines if it's not in law, as mm-hmm. you say. You know, there's mm-hmm. a way. For example, I'm um, a senior counsel is normally charge a certain percentage more of a junior attorney, for example, you know. So it's all percentage-wise, but um, there are general guidelines. But we know in Trinidad and Tobago, there's, and as in everywhere else, eh, there, are mm-hmm. ways of, there's, mm-hmm. there are ways of getting around these things. Mm-hmm. Your organization, the Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Service, just so that our listeners get a whole backdrop as to uh, on, on, on what basis we have this conversation, Ian Ramdani, what is, what is the Caribbean Institute of Security and Public Safety? All right. The Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Safety is a private sector organization that was established established to offer training and education in the areas of law enforcement, security, corrections, mm-hmm. corporate security, etc. Um, so we uh, we try to be the um, leader in this sector. In mm-hmm. addition, while other institutions like universities are generally in the area of Training in criminology, for example, we aim to be the specialist 
in this area. Mm-hmm. The article that I'm referring to, I think it appeared, was it in that Guardian? Was yes, it? we have yes, a... Yes, it was the Guardian that your article appeared in? Yes, we have a, right. mm-hmm. fr- um, a column every Friday in Trinidad mm-hmm. Guardian, mm-hmm. every Friday. You mentioned in, 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 in one of those columns, there seems to be inconsistency on the issue of bail matters. We still with the judiciary here. And uh, I am asking you, uh, what of the Sentencing Commission? Because um, if you have inconsistency in bail matters and, and sentencing, um, there should be something guide- uh, some guidelines there. Are there mandated guidelines to guide in the area of bail, the kind of bail that's granted from one court or the uh, or, or another one for the same offense, for instance. And, um, and so uh, do we have a sentencing uh, guideline that, that's there that's followed? All right, let's start with the Sentencing Commission. There was an act of parliament in the early 2000s. Can I remember the exact year? But the early 2000s, early 2000s established the Sentencing Commission. Mm-hmm. And we are in 20, it was passed by both houses and proclaimed, etc. And we are in 2016 and still awaiting the establishment of the Sentencing Commission. So it doesn't exist. It does not mm-hmm. exist. Mm-hmm. And no, the, this Sentencing Commission would have dealt with these matters of uneven bails, uneven sentencing, etc. that passes on in the magistrate court or the appeal court or high court. Um, so a sentencing commission would definitely even out the injustices or uneven sentences passed out by the different judicial officers. Mm-hmm. Um, as to whether there are guidelines, again, there are general guidelines, again, there are, there are general guidelines that will advise a magistrate or a high court to how do they prescribe bail. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the only two, the only two crimes that are not bailable would be homicide and treason. Make clear for our listeners the bail system, because I know there has been a call um, for folks to for for us to consider taking more cash and less real estate mm-hmm. as part of that of that bail. Explain uh, what is the percentage of cash to real estate that's involved in in in, in bail. Um, unfortunately, I do not have too much experience and knowledge okay. in, in, in those matters or to the proportions of okay I was uh, oh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay then I, I I will find that out myself I just when I start to look at the inconsistency in bail matters that of course is just a, a mm-hmm. subset of it but the inconsistency you think is 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 is, is wide enough to cause concern that you mentioned in your article yes because we saw for some offenses person a would get bail and then person B with a similar offense would not get bail mm-hmm of mm-hmm. course, each magistrate or judge would weigh any different circumstances mm-hmm. surrounding the matter. But sometimes there are very discrepancies, quite, quite alarming, in the granting of bail. And when you say we, you speak of the data you collect at the Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Service. Yes, and when, right. I, when I was at the other institutions as well, other universities before. Right. And then, so, so, okay, so this is data that, that you're looking at here. Two mm-hmm. or three months is what you proffer in your, in your article. Um, two or three months after the completion of an investigation, you believe a case should be called before the courts after the police have finished their investigation, Mm -hmm. and we are finding that is not the case because we have had instances where folks are sitting on remand for up to 12 years. So, in fact, the investigation is there. The person's been arrested. They've been charged, and they just sit there. Speak to um, how we can correct this with the limited resources we have now, and uh, if the inability to get this done is something should be at the door of the Chief Justice, is this something that should be... um, attributed to the um, funding of the judiciary not being under their control. Now it is, but it was not before. What, what is the reason you believe that we have this um, this um, long wait after an investigation is completed? And how do you think we can achieve what you suggest, which is a case going before um, the courts two or three months after the investigation has been completed? Yeah. It reeks of the whole inefficiencies in the administration of justice system. Eh? Um, there are inadequate courts, inadequate magistrates, mm-hmm. inadequate defenders, for example. Um, even the bail, the bail bill that is there now, um, where it grants someone 120 days without bail. So that means every 120 days, right? someone comes back to the court another time. And then mm-hmm. if you know how the courts are run for a day, for example, a magistrate comes to the court in the morning and spends about two to three hours postponing cases, calling, calling with this list. So this two to three hours, just wasting without even starting to try a matter. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. after lunch, now he or she will start to try a matter. 
then you have to make sure that everybody's there, the different witnesses are there, the different attorney t- attorneys are there. So again, we are just pinning it up in mud year after year, year after year, year after year, and with no resolution. The benchmark of sentencing and finding a resolution whether it's innocent or guilty still haven't been met after a decade, you would say. So the point you mentioned there where there are um, calls by the various attorneys to um, bring resolution to the inefficiency of the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. For example, the speeches of the Chief Justice, the Honorable Chief Justice. Eh? Um, where does it lie? It is a holistic pity there. Mm. We can't blame one person, for example, the Chief Justice, we can't blame the Attorney General. It's a collective effort need to be done and all stakeholders need to come on board to bring a resolution. But I think eh, the, the entity that has the most power would be the citizenry. Mm-hmm. If the citizens, via its interest groups so if an individual, put enough pressure on the authorities that be to come together to bring a resolution to the problems in the criminal justice system, we can expect some resolution. For example, the Chief Justice, while he has his budget recently, he still depends on the policy and the laws that are there. He necessarily cannot change the entire system. But have you seen uh, evidence uh, that shows that he is constrained or handicapped by what exists right now and what what, what, what aspects of law um, are we looking for an informed citizenry to insist be changed to allow this situation to be corrected? Right. For example, the Chief Justice is making some recommendations that certain laws be amended. For example, certain drug possession laws be amended. Certain sentences be amended in the laws, for example, so that would not clog up the prison system. As, as we all know, persons are held before the courts and in prison for man for several years for small, very small quantities of marijuana, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he has been making this call that certain things like these need to be removed from the books or adjusted. And therefore, it have a ripple effect in terms of um, eliminating some of the backlog in the, prison, in the court system mm-hmm. as well as the prisons where there are 14, 15, 16 people in one cell. You you, you mentioned um, a magistrate um, can get to um, his his her court and spend the first half of the morning dismissing and postponing cases. Yes. So we are talking about we don't have enough time at the end of the day um, to really pursue this. Then consistent with what you just said um, about the Chief Justice, my guest, by the way, is Ian uh, Ramdani. He's the principal of the Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Safety. Um, it, it, we may want to consider extending the court hours, and the best way to do that would be to establish some night courts, wouldn't it be? Most definitely. There are certain matters that are not as serious as, uh, say, a, um, a homicide matter, could be referred to a night court system mm-hmm. where we have former magistrates, for example, or former senior attorneys at law who may even wish to volunteer their time to donate back to our, our society that has treated them well as well too. Mm-hmm. And create night system, night court systems throughout Trinidad and Tobago, in the major districts, Port of Spain, Arima, San Fernando, Central, Tobago, those five areas, and petty matters could be held in the system. I mean, this has worked elsewhere across mm. the world. Why are we in Trinidad and Tobago still having him jump on a bandwagon? Did we not at some point um, experiment with the night court? Yes, sometime in the late 1990s, we would have established a pilot night court system, and I would believe it would have been in the Arima district. Mm. Um, the pilot system probably was probably for a few mm. months or a year at least. And after that, it all fizzled out. We haven't heard any recommendations or any findings of the, of, of, of the report. As what, to why it was discontinued. Correct, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, these um, these petty offenses, what we call petty, well, yeah, they are petty offenses. I mean, if you're looking at a, a okay, what about a, dra- a, a, a traffic court in the nighttime, it, it all depends on, you know, it may or may not be a small um, issue, but I mean, traffic offenses can be handled in a court a- after hours because it works both ways. It allows for the um, plaintiff um, not to take time off from his job, which is not affected productivity, <laughs> and, and getting into the city parking, getting to the court, and dealing with it. I mean, uh, is, 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 that to me seems to make a whole lot of sense. I'm surprised that something as simple as a traffic court has not been um, implemented. You looked at that in your report. Uh, give me a reason as best you understand why not. Um, again, resources. The authorities will tell you that there are inadequate resources to establish its 
there's traffic court system. For example, you need a physical structure. Mm -hmm. You need judicial officers. And then you need administrative staff to staff this um, organization. So it all comes down to the political will. Is there the political will by the various governments over time to establish this traffic court? The answer well, has been no so far. Yes, we have not seen that. No. Juvenile court is another thing um, that one would think um, would, would would benefit from these extra hours. I mean, you know, it's against clogging up the court with that. And some petty drug offenses, I mean, a uh, stick of, of marijuana or something uh, mm -hmm. of that nature is something that can be dispensed with without taking all the resources of a full day court. Yeah, regarding to the juvenile court, a couple of years ago, Trinidad and Trinidad and Tobago has received some international funding to establish mm -hmm. a juvenile court system. Mm -hmm. So the preparatory works are going on right now. They are actually tendering for certain aspects of it. So probably we can es expect in probably about, let's say, three to five years' time, a juvenile court system may be in place. What we have, though, we hmm. have a family court system, which was established about 10, 12 years ago. Um, it was a pilot system in the Port of Spain area, and it has worked quite well. And they have found the resources now to expand the family court system to probably San Fernando and one other area. So we have actually have a family court system now in Trinidad Tobago. It is 28 minutes after 10 o'clock, Sunday, July 10th. You're inside brunch from 107.7. I am Randy Bishop. Nice to have you here. My guest is uh, Ian Ramdani. We're talking about the, the, the court system. I, you know, one of the areas that, that caught my attention, because it has been offered and it has proven to work in, 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 you know, in other jurisdictions, I speak specifically of New York with what I'm familiar with, is this whole question of alternative sentencing alternative to imprisonment. Uh, you suggested that also in your report, and it caught my eye. Explain for, uh, for for those who may not be familiar with the concept. All right. Alternative to imprisonment is where there are sentences other than jail or prison, as we know, where persons can go and serve their sentence. Um, it is a, there are a variety of ways of someone can serve these alternative sentences. Um, there is community service, for example, and we do have a community service order legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. We do have that here. The issue is, why is that not being offered to, as a form of punishment for, for certain persons? Why is it always that you must go and serve time behind bars, for example? Um, so we need to emphasize more of those types of sentences, especially for the petty crimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, what, what will that lead to? A reduced backlog in, in our prison system. Plea, uh, I'm sorry, plea bargaining is another angle that I don't hear a lot of now. It may exist, and if, if you are aware of it, please let me know. But uh, effective plea bargaining system, do we have that here? To uh, some extent, yes. Yes, we do have it to some extent. Again, to what extent is it being used? Yeah, because your your article your ar article says, but why are we not looking at this? I was a bit surprised mm -hmm. to, to read. Yeah, it, um, it's not used as a great extent in the judicial system plea bargaining. We also have an important point to look at here: the parole system. Mm. We don't have any in Trinidad Twenty sixteen. Mm. I remember in the late nineteen nineties, I was in a cabinet appointed committee to look at the parole system in Trinidad Tobago to establish one. Mm -hmm. Governments changed. Committee dropped. Nobody picked up the idea again, too. May it clear to our listeners, what is the parole system? The, the, the parole system? Yeah, the parole system is where someone who is sentenced to prison, for, let's say for 10 years, for example, mm -hmm. and after serving five years in prison, he or, me, she, he or she may have been a well-behaved prisoner and then may be entitled to a parole hearing by a committee. And this committee will make a decision whether this person... All right, it's suitable to be replaced in the community, but under supervision by a parole officer. Um, so therefore, for the next five years remaining of sentence, the person is placed in the back in his society and can live his life, go to work, be with his family, uh, and be reporting to a parole officer. Mm -hmm. The minute he breaches any of the parole conditions, he returns to prison to serve the rest of his sentence. Mm -hmm. In a way, again, it reduces the backlog of the prison system and also give somebody a chance to reunite and reintegrate with his family and society. And, it's, it's, and to the best of your knowledge, no one has been talking about this before. Um, as I mentioned, let's say a decade or so ago, mm -hmm. after that, it all fell through. Um, kind of an ultimate question for you, and, and all of this is, uh, is what I saw in your article. Is there a website where folks can go up and look at that document, for instance? Sure. It's at 
www.caribbeansecurityinstitute.com caribbeaninstitute.com and we have about over 100 articles mm. there on mm. crime and security and, and i think yours was called fixing the criminal justice, criminal justice, justice system. system all right uh you mentioned something that uh, again has had its 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 um, advantages is 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 um advocates and its detractors the issue of a uh, oversight body uh, oversight body uh, for all elements of the criminal justice system where you get civilians involved with it uh, oftentimes you hear the, the the police saying the civilians don't understand those in the justice system saying they're not sufficiently trained um, to, to to be on an oversight body explain this oversight body that you're proposing for the criminal justice system and the composition you would like to see and how do you go about picking uh, members of the general public to sit on it. Right. Um, oversight bodies have been used elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, in London, for example, there are citizen oversight bodies that look after the policing department where the police station is located, for example. And police cannot get, in London, for example, eh, police will not be able to get increased funding from the state if the oversight body doesn't approve. Mm-hmm. So it shows importance that citizens put the power that citizens should have over various arms of the criminal justice system. Um, we need oversight bodies for the prison system. We need it for the judiciary, and we need it for law enforcement. Um, these bodies should compose members of the criminal justice system itself, mm-hmm. government representatives, opposition representatives, and academics researchers, and importantly, the normal man, the average man on the street. Mm-hmm. Because, for example, you can't live with the average man because in the judicial system, where there's a jury, it is the average one. So if the average man is here to determine guilt or innocence, mm-hmm. why can't this average person be able to look out to look after the various elements of the law enforcement or judiciary or prison system? Where they will be able to give a balanced approach for it rather than the technical aspects that all these lawyers and magistrates and we'll be looking at, right? Mm-hmm. These persons will give an average, the average man looking, off, looking, looking after and they will have the best interests of society at heart rather than these other people may have an agenda to cover, uncover certain things or to push a certain direction. How they can be chosen, for example, now, mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of NGOs in those community, NGOs, and they can be asked to serve for certain terms. For example, um, vision and mission, for example. If there is a prison oversight body, they can be asked to serve for a period of one year, then rotate it to someone else the other year, and so it can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ian, Ian Ramdani, my guest, is the principal of Caribbean Institute for Security and Public Safety with over 17 years in this area. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we mentioned three components. Yes. One is the judiciary, one is the police, and the other one is the uh, prison. Yes. Uh, speak, about, speak about what you see from your data collection, your observation, and your experience as as some of the major areas we can, one, two, three, seek to fix the prison Mm -hmm. system, or rather, if you articulate first what you see as the primary problems in the prison system. There is interconnectivity. We talked about that. that, That's fine. But as as an entity, Mm -hmm. what are are some of the primary problems you see there? The primary problem in the prison system would be the lack of resources physical resources, and human resources. Mm -hmm. Um, There are elements of training and rehabilitation in the various prison stations. However, it's limited to a few persons who who can access it. For example, if there's a literacy program, for example, it might be a handful of 10, 20 people Mm -hmm. out of a prison population over 800. So, again, resources. And if you actually see where these persons do this rehabilitation training, You'll be shocked. It's, mm-hmm. on, it's under a shed. It's under a tent. It's in the open area. Now, if you want to rehabilitate people and bring them back into society and give them a skill, conditions have to be much better than what it is right now. You spoke earlier of a political will to get a lot of things done. The first thing, when you speak of rehabilitation, it must be something that is bought by the citizenry. It must be folks seeing uh, prison as a place where you must rehabilitate people. And every time I hear it, it sounds almost as a place for punishment, not looking at the extended um, price that society will pay when that punishment is over and the person must come back to the society. Yes, and that's the big problem that society must face, eh? 
do we want to expend money to rehabilitate prisoners? Or do we think the prison should be a place of punishment? Or do we want to spend it on the front end or the back end? <laughs> Correct. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because you're not going to get away from it. Correct. If you don't do it on, 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 on the, the end where they're in prison, when they come back into society with limited skills but advanced um, criminal training mm -hmm. from conversations in the prison, mm -hmm. then they're coming back out there and you're going to spend it from the back end. Correct. Eventually, they're going to come back in the mm -hmm. system. For example, our studies have found mm -hmm. that there's a 62% prisoner recidivism rate. Mm -hmm. That means six out of ten prisoners who come out of prison go in to commit crime yeah. and end up back in the prison. Your revolving door, yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty high. Six, mm -hmm. Sixty something percent. Mm -hmm. So therefore you're not you're not winning. Whatever we are doing right now is not working because six out of ten is coming back in. So you have to spend that resources back in the prison system there to see how do you convert that sixty something percent, bring it down incrementally fifty percent 40%, and after a while, it will, might taper off around 10, 15, 20%, because you'll never save everyone, as we all know, right? I, 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 I sought you out because of your article, and because I thought your article, and I still feel that your article uh, and the research at your institute is something that's important. If we are talking to people about where we're spending the money on the front end or the back end, understanding that the prison issue is our issue invariably um we have got pe to have people educating the public as to mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. i thought your article went along with towards articulating that and I, and I believe that is what we're missing here uh, for people to understand that there is a cost for us not insisting on legislation on those who are governing us to implement rehabilitation as a parallel experience for prisoners mm -hmm. Yes, because... But we have to educate people all the time. Correct. And that's, mm -hmm. where, um, and that's where government policy is. The government policy must be to educate its population. And it comes into either the prison service should do it, or the Ministry of the Attorney General, or the Ministry of National Security, or the Ministry of Public Information. You need different agencies to come on board and develop an appropriate policy. How do we educate the population in certain areas? In this area, it being crime but other areas in education and health and stuff, right? But we're talking about crime and security here. And if we cannot get a proper policy in place to educate these people, well, then we again just do the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Yeah, that is all normally considered the um, epitome of madness or Correct. the manifestation of <laughs> yes. madness, going about the same, same approach um, and expecting a different result. All right. So if we had to lock this in, let's see, we walked into the judiciary heavily. We spent some time mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the prison service. You, you, you alluded earlier to a fact, the low detection rate in the police service. Is that from your observation? Um, at the Caribbean Institute for uh, Security and Public Safety. Is that uh, a, an issue of training? Is that a, a case of having the tools, the technology? Is that a case of corruption already in the ranks needing to be um, taken out? What primarily you think? Or is it because everybody's just eating a food? I mean, primarily, what do you think is the reason uh, that the detection rate it is, it is so low from the information you have gathered? Yeah. It will be a combination of what you mentioned there, but primarily I think it would be commitment, staff commitment and resources and the administration of the police service itself. To what extent, how many, what proportion are, of the police's resources are devoted to detection? And I would say it's going to be pretty low. All right. To what extent is the technology shared across the various, various police stations and various officers? Again, I'm going to say it's going to be low. Um, the police service do engage in training and it must be encouraged and increased. But then after all this training, how do you tie in these things to detection? Mm. Um, recently we saw the Commissioner of Police transferring 40 officers into the Homicide Bureau. Yes. To boost it. Yes. So we see that is a positive step. Hopefully and he's, uh, he's hoping to take that up to 100 and then uh, double that in, in short order too. <laughs> yes, years. definitely. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the public wants a proper detection rate that we want. You won't be able to solve 100% of the crimes but you want an increased detection rate, and we have not been using all of the technology that is available worldwide. I mean, you just look at any, look at anywhere else of any, any of the developed countries, for example, the technology are there. No longer you will find citizens willing to come forward to bring information, because to solve any crime, you need information. Mm -hmm. And there's a low percentage of persons willing to come forward 
to provide information, and that's for a number of reasons. A whole discussion myself. And, and one primarily is what I raised with you: the question that you feel that if I go and I tell John in the in the station I'm complaining about X Y Z, I'm worried that before I leave the station, John or Tom in the station already told Harry out in the street that I made the report. So there is no confidence in 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 our institutions. Most definitely, the public confidence in the police service are below fifty percent. That's why I asked you of corruption. I, I, try, I try to throw the. I, I can't open the gate for you, but you didn't want to walk in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll jump in now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, the issue of police corruption has always been with us in the past. Um, it's going to be here now. It'll always be with us. Um, and all over the world. But folks are saying it is amazing in Trinidad and Tobago, in all areas of, of our, our, our protectors, uh, we have this um, this cancer spreading. Correct, correct. And we need to... You say correct because your data uh, suggests that. Most definitely, yes, Mm, yes. And again, we need... And this is where, for example, an oversight body, a citizen oversight body, would be able to deal with certain things, whereas the police service may be able to cover up certain things. A citizen oversight body would be able to pick it up. Now, we have the Police Compliance Authority. Yes. Which does this as well, too. Mr. West, yes. Yeah, Mr. David West. And then there's the Internal Police Compliance Department. So we have... Okay, Which is, in a way, fighting with Mr. David right. West. Himself <laughs> investigating himself. <laughs> yes. uh, but but yeah. I vote for them. We have the citizen, mm. lack of citizen, citizen oversight. Eh? Mm-hmm. And this is why we really need to get down to citizen oversight and dealing with the corruption in very simple matters. Generally, most people who are victim of crime would not report it. Unless it's a serious crime like um, large larceny or murder or physical assault or something. But if someone misses something home, for example, in, in their yard, mm-hmm. they're not going to report it because they believe mm. first something's not going to be done. And then what is the likelihood of they going to look for this person? The answer is very low or zero. I got to wrap this up, uh, Ian um, Ramdani, uh, principal of the Caribbean Institute of Security and Public Service. I wanted you here because you did exactly what I was hoping you would do, which is to bring to light not only that we have these problems, because folks have heard them echoed before, but some possible uh, solutions. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I want to believe that these night courts we talked about would, in mm-hmm. fact, um, come on stream one way or the other. I mean, you know, if you don't do it that way, then all this, then this postponement and this large uh, 11 year wait in remand will continue mm-hmm. if we don't understand that rehabilitation must be a, a, a companion of, of incarceration then we are going to be paying a price forever the revolving mm-hmm. door recidivism rate will continue mm-hmm. um, as you have articulated one two three Crime does not happen in conclusion in a vacuum. It takes a long time to get to where you are. Did, did, what, what we are experiencing today did not happen today. didn't happen a no. year ago. did not happen two years ago. It happened a long time. It takes mm-hmm. some time to start to correct it. Are you encouraged by what you are hearing? Um, and, and sometimes you can be encouraged by silence if something mm-hmm. is happening, too. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of folks say, hey, you know, um, I'm not hearing anything being done about it. Mm-hmm. But uh, what is it, if I remember well, many a day was made famous because seemingly nothing was done the day before in preparation. Mm-hmm, yeah. So sometimes you have to stay quiet because mm-hmm. you can hear people talking all the time and really saying nothing. Do you think, uh, do you feel encouraged by what you're hearing or your um, <clears throat> optimism is in limbo? My optimism is in limbo, uh, <laughs> as you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, um, we are still doing the same things over and over and over. I'm not getting any different result, And I'm not hearing anything new, anything innovative to tackle the crime problem. I'm not. We are dealing with strictly um, immediate knee-jerk responses Mm. to crime at this point Mm. in time. Mm. And we are not thinking medium term Mm. and long term. Now, we're not saying you mustn't have a knee-jerk immediate response. That is very important as well. eh? But that medium term, long term response to deal with crime is more important. For example, and one of the targeted areas where you must start is is Mm -hmm. at the primary school or even the early childhood school system. That's the way it starts. Recently, I've been having a discussion with the the ECC principals and some teachers. And the kind of problem these three-year-olds and four-year-olds are exhibiting in these schools, Mm -hmm. they are even referred to psychologists Mm -hmm. and psychiatrists at three, four years. Yeah, seriously, Brian, we, we must continue this because I'm running in, I'm running uh, past my time on this mm-hmm. right now. But Ian Ramdani, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. I truly appreciate you coming oh, in. You're welcome, sir. And um, I am going to stay optimistic. I am going to hope that the silence I hear is a planning silence and not a continuation of the same thing, silence. 